Hello, welcome to the channel Why Stories. Enjoy watching. Rokelia was standing by the scorching iron fence. The morning was incredibly hot. She was thirsty but too afraid to buy lemonade. After about 20 minutes, she couldn't resist any longer and sat down in the shade of a big tree. Leo, hi. The girl exclaimed joyfully. The cat, purring, leaped into her arms. They didn't only look the same, the girl's dirty, disheveled hair and the old, patchy fur of the cat, but they also had similar fates. Rokelia wasn't bothered by the fact that Leo was a stray cat. To be honest, sometimes they scavenged together in the large dumpster near that store. Leo had a knack for finding something tasty, a half-eaten pastry, a piece of fresh bread, or a half-rotten apple, and they would sit down together to have lunch. Leo, you're my best friend. I have no one else but you, Rokelia said, petting the cat lovingly. You know, someday we'll have a home together. Suddenly, Rokelia jumped to her feet. Leo, go away. Old Bat is coming. The girl quickly approached the church gate. Don't you dare leave from here, the old woman hissed at Rokelia as she swiftly walked away. Today, you won't have dinner. She glared at her with malice and disappeared. Rokelia stood silently, tears welling up in her eyes. The cat, seeing that she was left alone, quickly ran to her side. Leo, my dear, we should be strong, the girl said through tears. You'll see, we'll escape one day. The day turned out to be very long. Finally, the sun began to set. Rokelia kissed her friend, gave him one last pet, and slowly made her way home. The cat often accompanied her and knew where she lived, but he never entered her yard. It seemed like he understood everything when Rokelia once told him. Leo, kitten, you can't come with me. Please wait for me by the church. If old bat catches you, she'll harm you. Where's the money? The old woman asked when the girl entered, propping her hands on her hips. Rokelia handed her a plastic jar. Is that all, you little rascal? What do I feed you? I saw how you work today. You won't get any food for two days, she said, grabbing Rokelia's hand and dragging her into the barn. The first time Rokelia spent a night in the barn, she cried all night long. She was about six years old then. It was the end of October, and she was terribly cold. She begged her caregiver to return to the house, but she was relentless. Over time, Rokelia realized that tormenting the girl gave her pleasure, and she stopped reacting so strongly. Time passed, and over the course of a year, the girl grew accustomed to her dwelling. When it was cold, she would bury herself in the straw and remnants of old blankets that old Bat had thrown her way. Rokelia silently entered her barn, heard the creak of the door and the click of the lock, and looked around. In an old bucket, there was water that Rokelia had managed to collect during the last rain. She took a worn-out ladle, quenched her thirst, and washed her face. In reality, Rokelia was even glad that she could be alone here. She didn't have to face her inhuman caregiver. The only thing that bothered her was that old Bat didn't allow her to use the toilet and forced her to do her business right there in the barn. Rokelia tried to create some privacy as best she could, but the pit she dug emitted unpleasant odors nonetheless. Not having dinner isn't the worst thing, Rokelia thought. Tomorrow, she and Leo will surely find something to eat. But Rokelia was afraid of the constant checks her guardian imposed. According to her plan, the girl had to stand by the church gates from 8 in the morning until 7 in the evening. Therefore, Old Bat checked on her once, and sometimes even twice, a day. Rokelia couldn't reveal herself, so Grimsa usually approached, made threatening remarks, and then left. There was always something wrong, either Rokelia was standing incorrectly, she had too joyful a face, or the sign that read for bread. My mom is seriously ill wasn't visible. In short, each time, she found a new reason to punish Rokelia. Sometimes, when there were very few people around and the girl came without money, the old bat would lash her with a belt. The first time, Rokelia was shocked and cried bitterly. But then she promised herself she would remain silent. 
Despite her young age, she quickly realized that showing her pain to her guardian only made her even more cruel. Rokelia sat on her straw bed and gazed through a large gap. Her home was far, far away. She saw her mom sitting on the porch. Mom! Little Rokelia ran into the yard. Look what I brought you. The girl handed her mother a bouquet of cornflowers. Rokelia, my dear, thank you. Her mother hugged her. You're such a smart girl. Mom, I love you so much. She said, kissing her mother's tan cheeks. Rokelia shuddered upon hearing the bolt scrape. She quickly approached another wall. Looking through a small gap, she realized that her guardian had gone somewhere. Rokelia felt relieved. She never felt safe when that woman was at home. There were days when she would return in the evening and unleash her anger on Rokelia. She cursed her, her mother, and everything dear to Rokelia. Since the house of Old Bat was secluded, no one could hear what happened behind those high walls. Rokelia ran away many times, but she didn't know where to go. She always ended up returning. Besides, Old Bat had some relatives in the police, so they could easily track her down. Rokelia decided that in a year or two, when she grew older, she would be better at navigating, and then she and Leo would escape. She longed to return home, but for now, she didn't know the way back. The girl's memories overwhelmed her once again. She had spent three days at Aunt Eleanora's place. They told her that her mom had gone somewhere and she needed to wait for her. On the fourth day, a man came into Aunt Eleanora's yard. Back then, Rokelia didn't yet understand that he was a policeman. They discussed something with Aunt Eleanora. It was evident that she was worried, talking and gesturing towards the houses. Aunt Eleanora, when will my mom come back? Rokelia asked anxiously when the unfamiliar man left. Rokelia, your mom needs to stay in town for a little while. We'll wait for her here, Aunt Eleanora reassured the girl, patting her on the head. A week later, she entered the yard. Rokelia didn't immediately take a liking to her. Small, angry eyes darted around, and the corners of her lips were perpetually turned downward, creating an impression of constant displeasure. Clodomira, hello. Aunt Eleanora rushed to greet the unfamiliar woman. They talked for about half an hour, and Aunt Eleanora invited her inside. Meet Rokelia, Aunt Eleanora introduced the girl to her neighbor. The old woman cast a disapproving glance at her. Rokelia, this is your grandmother, Aunt Eleanora introduced the girl to the stranger. Well, not a grandmother. I'm a distant relative, Clodomira retorted, clearly unhappy. Rokelia, for now, you'll stay with your relative and then your mom will come to get you. Don't worry, your mom will be here soon, Aunt Eleanora tried to cheer the girl up. Rokelia snapped back to the present. It was already late in the evening, and she felt drowsy. Throwing on some old rags, she settled down to sleep. Rokelia saw herself in a big house. There were beautiful sofas and large cabinets. Everything was unfamiliar to her. She wanted to go outside. Rokelia opened the door and found herself in a beautiful, blooming garden. Along the path among the bushes, Leo came running towards her. Rokelia, my girl. She heard a familiar voice. Mom. She exclaimed and immediately woke up. This unfamiliar house had appeared in her dreams many times before. She didn't know what place it was, but she felt good there. The only thing Rokelia couldn't do was see her mother's face. She always heard only her voice. Hey, you, get up. An annoying screech interrupted her joy. Get ready for work. Rokelia's stomach growled so loudly that she herself wanted to leave as quickly as possible. She hoped to find something delicious today. There were days when she and Leo found a big slice of pizza or an entire burger. And once, they were so lucky, they found a whole sausage stick in a dumpster. You and your mother have burdened my life. Clodomira grumbled to herself, shooing Rokelia out the gate. I hate you so much. You're absolutely useless. In reality, all of this was staged. Clodomira was making a good income thanks to Rokelia, and honestly, she was afraid of losing her. 
She remembered the first time she brought Rokelia. Back then, her anger had no bounds. Being greedy by nature, she resented the girl. Why should I spend money on her? So what if they pay me to be her guardian? They should be grateful I provided her with a place to stay, the old bat grumbled. But soon enough, she realized how to make a decent profit from Rokelia and came up with a cunning plan. Summer was in full swing, and the sun was scorching from early morning. Rokelia stood by the church, preparing her work tools, a plastic jar and a cardboard sign with a big inscription. Today was Sunday, and people were rushing to the morning service. How is your mom, dear? A young woman asked. She always tossed Rokelia some change, and on holidays, she placed larger bills in her jar. My mom is seriously ill, Rokelia began reciting her rehearsed lines. She needs expensive treatment, and we don't have money. We can't even afford to buy bread. Please help in any way you can. She never forgot to thank people when coins dropped into her jar. Thank you very much. May God bless you and your family with good health, Rokelia said gratefully. Rokelia stood for another half hour, and Leo the cat appeared on the road. Leo, where have you been? I'm so hungry. Let's hurry, we only have five minutes, the girl ran to meet him. Come on, faster. They both darted toward a large dumpster. Today, their luck was indeed in a whole container of leftovers, a bag of overripe bananas, and three perfectly intact rolls. We're so lucky. Rokelia exclaimed, hugging her cat. Hiding behind a big tree, they quickly had their breakfast. Leo, it's time for me to go to work, Rokelia said as she got up. I'll be waiting for you at lunch. Today was a good day. Rokelia checked her jar. It was halfway full of coins. She usually hid paper money in her pocket. Tiredly, she leaned against the fence. It had gotten even hotter after lunch, and it was very difficult to stand passers-by went back and forth, only occasionally paying attention to the pleas of the little girl. Rokelia suddenly remembered her first days. She was standing by the church and crying loudly. People came up to her one after another, asking what had happened. I want to see my mom, the little girl sobbed. Take me to my mom. Someone called the police. A tall man got out of the car. Don't worry, we'll figure this out, he said kindly. Rokelia was put in the car, and they took her to the police station. Where are you from? What's your name? An unfamiliar woman asked her in a friendly manner. Lorenza, I know this girl. Her mother is sick. A 45-year-old man approached her. I'll take care of it. The man drove Rokelia home. You better be careful, Clodomira, he told Rokelia's guardian. Try to talk to her. Oh, she's still unintentional, Fernando, she replied to her nephew. Just cover for me, will you? For several weeks, they brought the crying Rokelia to the police station, but then they would bring her home again. If you ever complain to anyone again, Old Bat said, taking a knife from the table, I'll skin you alive and make you into a rug. Rokelia was so frightened that she couldn't speak for several days. From that day on, she stopped complaining and searching for her mother. Finally, the workday came to an end. Rokelia hid the remaining roll and two bananas under a tree, gathered her things, and headed home. Not even 20 meters away, she saw a familiar car near the fence. Rokelia entered the yard and slipped into the barn. She didn't know why this police officer had come, so she decided to hide to avoid giving herself away. A few minutes later, the house door creaked and she could hear someone talking. Several people suddenly stopped as they passed by the barn. Rokelia stopped breathing. Clodomira, I keep telling you, this is impossible. They will check on you, the man in the police uniform said. Fernando, please do something, pleaded her guardian. What are we going to live on, then? Clodomira, the authorities will register Rokelia for school. And if she doesn't attend, they might even arrest you. Do you understand? No matter what connections I have, if it goes to the capital, we'll be screwed. Clodomira's nephew waved his hands nervously. But why do I need her, then? 
the old bat cursed. She forced herself upon me, her, and her mother. Well, you do get some decent money for her, the policeman said. Clodemeyer made a pitiful face. Do you think we can survive on that now? Do you know how much I spend on her? Do you really think that if we had enough money, I would have started all of this? I warned you, Clodemeyer, and you do as you see fit, her nephew waved his hand and left the yard. Despite the good earnings that day, Clodemeyer beat Rokelia so badly that she couldn't walk for several days. She was lying on her stomach in the barn on the straw, and tears were streaming down her cheeks. I'll escape, she whispered. I will. Leo the cat nervously paced around the church, but Rokelia was nowhere to be found. On the first day, he waited for her until evening, never leaving his place under the old tree. On the second day, he was sitting by the church gates from early morning. He approached passers-by, looking into their eyes, but couldn't find an answer. Finally, he decided. Leo, Rokelia joyfully whispered when she saw her friend through the cracks in the barn. Leo, my kitty, I'm okay, don't worry. Rokelia was very afraid that the old bat might see the cat. She realized that she wouldn't stop at anything until she destroyed him. All right, run away, she ordered through tears. The cat started running but suddenly stopped. He turned and wanted to come back. Leo, no. Please, go, Rokelia cried. She buried her face in the straw to stifle any noise. When she lifted her head, the cat was gone. The next morning, Rokelia got up. She cleaned her blood-crusted wounds and, limping, walked through the barn. Suddenly, the door creaked. Come on, get ready for work. No use being idle, her guardian entered the barn. Seeing Rokelia's wounds and bruises, she added. If anyone asks, tell them you fell from a tree. Rokelia slowly walked, sometimes stopping for a little. Her back throbbed from the lash, and the wounds on her knees made it difficult to walk. She approached the church, and the cat was sitting by the gate. It was hard to say what was on his mind, but from that day on, he never left Rokelia again. Clodemeyer nervously paced back and forth in the house. Now what do I do? She asked herself. I had everything so well arranged, and then this happens. The girl brought in some decent money, but if she goes to school, how can she beg for a living? Besides, we'll need to spend money on clothes, textbooks, and so much more. Her plan was indeed a good one. After Laura, Rokelia's mother, was wanted for several days and the police couldn't find her, it became clear that the chances were slim. Village residents rarely went to the swamp. Only those who worked with medicinal herbs could survive there. When Clodemira took the girl in, she quickly realized that she could make something out of this situation. She understood that if Rokelia's mother was ever found, she would lose everything. Fernando, my dear, come over quickly, her nephew heard his aunt's worried voice. Within 20 minutes, he was in her yard. Clodemira, what happened? He asked with concern. Fernando, this morning I went to check the mailbox, and I found this. She handed him a piece of paper. Clodemira, thank you for Rokelia. Don't look for me. I've met the man of my dreams. I won't come back. Forgive me, Fernando read the note. We were running around looking for her, and she's organizing her life, Clodemira cursed. I've burdened myself with this. I'm old and my health is poor. Yes, it seems like she just ran away, her nephew agreed. Fernando, can you please help keep the investigator off my back? If everything is clear now, maybe we can just drop the case. Clodemeyer pleaded. Yes, why bother the police? I'll attach this note to the case, and that'll be the end of it, Fernando replied. Clodemeyer understood that by planting the note herself, she had taken a risk. But besides the swamp, Laura had nowhere else to go, and if that were the case, it was unlikely she would have made it out alive. It had been a very tough day, and Rokelia could barely make it home. Her wounds had been scorched by the hot sun, and the skin was pulling tight. Leo walked confidently beside her. They arrived at a tall fence. 
Leo, let's make a deal, Rokelia said, looking the cat straight in the eyes. If I'm not at our spot, then and only then, you hear me, can you cautiously sneak into the yard? Promise me. The cat closed its eyes. All right, now go, the mistress ordered. The cat slowly walked back. Clodomira still didn't know what to do. She had wanted to take out her anger on Rokelia, but she stopped herself. I might go too far and create problems for myself because of this wretched girl, she thought. Rokelia handed over all the money to her guardian and went to her barn. She carefully sat on the straw bedding and closed her eyes. She wanted to lie down, but her back hurt badly. She heard the lock clicking and realized that old Bat had locked her in. A few minutes later, Rokelia fell asleep. The room was dark, and Rokelia couldn't see anything. Suddenly, she heard someone moaning. She approached cautiously. No! Clodomira screamed, covering her face with her hands. What's wrong with you? Rokelia asked. Get him out of here! Clodomira shouted with all her might. And Rokelia abruptly woke up. She felt a little better today. Salvador watched her. A young girl, flickering among the trees, approached a large flower bed. She picked some flowers and examined them closely. Luz? He called out to her. She turned and happily walked over to him. I really like wildflowers, she said. Just look at these cornflowers. You're my most beautiful flower, he said, hugging her around the waist and pulling her close. I've been looking for you for so long. Perhaps I've been waiting for you for a long time too, she replied, but then her eyes filled with sadness. Salvador still couldn't believe that he had found the woman of his dreams. They had met under very strange circumstances, but he definitely knew she was the one. The radiance that emanated from her gave him everything he had ever dreamed of. Tired of luxurious women and fortune hunters, he had truly found her. What are you thinking about? He asked, stroking her hair. We've been together for over a year now, but I just can't. Tears started streaming down her cheeks. Sweetheart, it takes time, be patient. The doctor said it's possible. We just need to wait a little longer, he reassured her. Let's go for a ride and explore some unfamiliar places. All right, she agreed. After lunch, they got into the car and drove wherever their eyes took them. Salvador loved Luz dearly. His only wish was to make her happy, and he put in every effort to help her. The car stopped near a vast field. The wheat stalks shimmered with gold, ready for harvest. Luz wanted to pick some wheat grains and walked ahead. Suddenly, she heard, Mom, Mommy. She turned around, but there was no one around, just complete silence. She quickly turned and walked back to the car. Salvador, please, take me home, she said, her voice trembling with anxiety. What's wrong, Luz? He asked, hugging her. I heard that voice again. Please, take me home. They remained silent throughout the journey back home. Shards of old memories kept haunting his wife, but he couldn't do anything about it. Salvador decided to visit his friend the next day. It was around 10 in the morning when he opened the door and entered the private clinic. Salvador, hello. A middle-aged man greeted him with a hug. Giorgio, it's great to see you, Salvador replied with joy. Take a breath, the doctor said in amazement. You've managed to do it after all. Where did you get your treatment, here or abroad? Giorgio, to be honest, it's an unusual story. No rush, Salvador. I have some time. Giorgio asked not to be disturbed for about an hour, and the two men sat down at a table. So, Giorgio said, making coffee. So, Salvador repeated. My condition was getting worse and worse. The attacks became so frequent that sometimes I felt like I was suffocating. After several months of unsuccessful treatment in the capital, I decided not to delay any longer and organized treatment in Germany. I did feel better there, but my treating physician said that the remission would be short-lived. They also didn't know how to help me. 
When I returned home, I realized that Standard Medicine had done everything it could for me. I resigned myself to the fact and simply waited to see which of my attacks would be the last. One day, our gardener approached me. Salvador, maybe it's not my business, but I know a healer. He saved my brother. He's quite eccentric, but he's helped many people, he said. At first, I didn't pay much attention to it, but when I had another attack, I decided to take the risk. Ignacio, where does this healer live? Maybe he can come here? I'll pay him well, I asked the gardener. Unfortunately, it won't work. He only practices at his place. He gives herbs to some, lays hands on others, and takes some to the forest. He has a different method of treatment for each patient. So, I decided to go to this healer. Ignacio told me how to find the way to him. I arrived and knocked on the gate, but no one answered. I thought, maybe the old man isn't home. After a while, the healer's neighbor came out onto the street. Do you know where Abundio might be? I asked her. Oh, there he is, sitting in the yard, she replied. I knocked on the gate again, but the old man didn't come out. I thought, maybe he's deaf. So I yelled and banged him on the gate for half an hour. Then I gave up on the whole thing, got in my car, and was about to leave when the gate suddenly opened. You gave up pretty quickly, said the short old man with a beard. You want to be healthy, but you have no patience. I was dumbfounded. How do you know that? Well, if you don't have any health problems, why did you come to me? He invited me in. I sat on a bench, and he stared at me intently without taking his eyes off me. What kind of daycare is this? I thought. Then the old man sat down next to me and said, Only one thing will help the old pine tree near the upper swamps. I agree. I'll pay you. What do you need, the cones or the bark? The old man replied, You have to go there yourself. You know, that's a bit too much. I stood up and went home. Several days passed, and I was feeling worse and worse. So, I went back to the old man's village. When I arrived, he was sitting on a bench in front of his house. Well, when will we go? Now or shall we have coffee? The old man asked, quite pleased. We had coffee, changed our clothes, and went to the place. You'll do as I tell you. Our journey will be long, Abundio said. And indeed, the road turned out to be long. At one point, I thought the old man might lead me somewhere and abandon me. Just a little further to the upper swamps. We'll cut through there and go downhill, Abundio said. It was probably about three hours before we reached our destination. There it is, the old man pointed with his hand. We'll climb up to it now. The pine tree was truly enormous. It might have been over a hundred years old, maybe even two hundred. The trunk was so thick that the two of us couldn't wrap our arms around it. Approach the tree, lean your head against it, and start breathing, the healer said. I did just that. At first, it was difficult to breathe, but then it felt as if the air itself began to fill my bronchial tubes and lungs. I couldn't recall ever breathing so freely before. I felt so good that I lost track of time. The old man was standing by the pine tree, muttering some prayers. Now, imagine that you're nauseous and you want to get rid of everything in your stomach, Zero the healer said. At first, I couldn't do anything, but then I did start feeling nauseous, and after a while, yellow foam began to come out of me. I don't know how long it lasted, but eventually, I fell weakly onto the grass. Well, now everything will be fine, son, the old man said, patting me on the head. And from that moment on, I never had another attack. Giorgio was wide-eyed with amazement. Salvador, do you know that pine essential oils are one of the best remedies for lung diseases? Apparently, due to its age, this pine tree releases oils in very high concentrations, which produce such a healing effect. I'm amazed. How did the old man know about this? Giorgio, I don't know, but that old man did so much for me. They talked a bit more, and then Salvador said, Giorgio, I really need your help. It's about my wife. 
As Lou strolled through the garden, she enjoyed the surroundings. There was something about this place that felt familiar, but she couldn't quite put her finger on it. Daisies, cornflower, she ran her hand over the flowers. Mom? She suddenly heard. Luz turned around, but there was no one in the garden. She had first heard this voice the day after she was discharged from the hospital, and ever since, it had been constantly haunting her. Who is this? What does it mean? Luz asked herself. Over a year had passed, but she still couldn't find answers to these questions. She silently wandered along the narrow paths, realizing how fortunate she was. Salvador had become everything to her. When she first saw him in the hospital, she was greatly embarrassed. Don't worry, the young man said, taking her hand. I'll stay with you. At first, Luz thought he was helping her out of sympathy, but very quickly, she noticed the sparkle in his eyes. After a few months, she realized she was in love. She didn't know what the future held, but her heart told her she could trust Salvador. From that day on, you could have called her the happiest woman, if only she could. Luz, my dear, she said, hearing a familiar voice. Salvador, my love. She ran to meet him. Luz, I talked to my friend Giorgio. He knows a good doctor. On Thursday, after lunch, we're all going to see him. Are you okay with that? Salvador, of course. I want to recover as soon as possible. July passed quickly, and August arrived. Clodomira realized that time was running out, but she still couldn't figure out what to do with Rokelia. Why didn't I think of this before? She exclaimed joyfully one morning. I can get rid of the girl and earn good money. That evening, someone knocked on her gate. I'm coming. She shouted. Several unfamiliar people were standing near the fence. One told us to come, one of them said. Come in, she said hospitably. These matters shouldn't be resolved on the street. Two men and one woman entered the yard. Clodomira led the guests into her house. She's a well-behaved girl and works hard, the homeowner began the conversation. How old is she? An elderly gypsy asked. She just turned seven. We need to see her work first, and then we'll discuss the price. Then, please, go to the church. She's waiting by the gates. She's alone. You'll notice her right away. We'll take a look at her now, and then we'll discuss matters. The gypsies left Clodomira's house and headed towards the church. It was around four o'clock in the afternoon, and the heat was gradually subsiding. A dark-haired girl was standing by the church gate. Her hair was disheveled and dirty. Her old clothes were riddled with holes, and her dirty feet were clad in oversized rubber slippers. Rokelia occasionally uttered plaintive cries for help. Well, what do you think? The elderly gypsy asked his relatives. She knows how to work, the young man said. And she looks so pitiful, the woman added. The gypsies returned to Clodomira. I told you she was a good girl. You'll be lucky with her. She chatted around them. The old gypsy told the price. Oh, come on. I've invested so much in her. I've given her so much. Rokelia's guardian shook her head negatively. They couldn't agree for a long time, but in the end, they managed to reach an agreement. Just as we agreed on the 25th. If you take the girl earlier, I'll make a big fuss with the police. You won't get away with it, she warned the gypsies with a malicious look. Adolfo will come to you on the 23rd, late in the evening, to confirm our deal. Clodomira rubbed her hands contentedly. She had intentionally inflated the price, but she hadn't even dreamed of such an amount. From this day on, I'll stop feeding her. I won't spend another penny on her, the old bat decided. And this time, Clodomira's plan was a good one. The police knew that Rokelia was searching for her mother and had attempted to escape multiple times. The gypsies would take her at night and drive her far away from here. The police wouldn't find Rokelia and they wouldn't blame Clodomira. Fernando would take care of that. Hello, Salvador. Hello, Luz, Giorgio said, opening the car door. 
Hello, Salvador's wife greeted Giorgio. Hello, Giorgio, get in, Salvador said. You're going to show us the way, because I have no idea where we're going. It's not far from here, he said. The road was half empty, so they arrived at their destination in half an hour. Marco was an experienced doctor who had dealt with several similar cases in his practice. Of course, this is not an easy matter, and no one can guarantee quick results, Giorgio said, stepping out of the car. I understand, Luz replied. But I'm ready for anything. They climbed the steps and knocked on the right door. Giorgio, friends, please come in, the doctor greeted his guests. Everyone entered the office. Marco invited everyone to sit down and said, Luz, we will talk to you later. Please lie down on the couch. You need to relax and close your eyes. I will ask your husband a few questions. Just listen. Salvador, when did you first see Luz? I'll start from the very beginning. I've been an asthmatic since childhood, and I suffered greatly because of it. Despite my father's condition, my parents couldn't cure me. They tried the most expensive medications and inhalers, but the illness would only calm down temporarily, then flare up again. Over time, the periods of remission became much shorter, and a few years ago, my life turned into a living hell. Traditional medicine couldn't help me anymore, so I turned to a local healer for assistance. Abundio told me about a very old pine tree in the high swamps, and he said that if I went with him, I had a chance to be healed. I agreed, and we set off. And indeed, being near that mighty tree, a miracle happened with my bronchial tubes, they cleared up. For the first time in my life, I started to breathe freely. The road was long, and Abundio said that on our way back, we would take a lower path to shorten it by about an hour and a half. The terrain was swampy and treacherous, but the old healer knew it well. Look, do you see? It's the Marsh Labrador Tea, the healer pointed to the bushes with white fluffy caps. It's June now, and many herbs are in bloom. How long have you been doing this? I asked the old man. What do you mean? Well, treating people. Salvador, it's like a surname that's passed down, just like this gift. My father wasn't interested in it, but my grandfather. He helped so many people. I can't even begin to compare myself to him. See this? It's bug bean. It's good for treating thyroid problems, among other things. You might think, what's the use of this small plant? But you see. I stepped closer, and my foot sank into something soft. Be more careful. The marsh is tricky. You need to be careful here. I decided not to take any more risks and followed the old man. Suddenly, he stopped abruptly. Dear Lord, is it a person? I looked but saw nothing. Then I saw the old man quickly disappear ahead and into the woods. I followed him, and where he had vanished, there was a cliff. Down near the swamp, someone was lying. She's alive, just unconscious, Salvador. Help me. I descended, and there was a woman. Her face was battered, and large branches were strewn around her. It seemed one of them had hit her on the head. Her whole head and face were covered in blood. Salvador, take off your clothes quickly. Abundio made a makeshift stretcher out of branches and our clothes. We laid the woman on it and began carrying her. Salvador, those are low marshes. We won't be able to make it through. Those places are dangerous. We won't take any risks. We'll go back where I originally told you, Abundio said. Abundio, are you sure she's alive? I asked, shocked. Yes, Salvador, but we don't have much time. She needs to get to the hospital, to the ICU. I can't help her with that. We quickly moved, stumbling over bumps and trying not to drop the makeshift stretcher. Abundio, what could have happened? I asked. I don't know, Salvador, but those places are very treacherous. Only a few people can navigate them. There's a vast area beneath the marshes, and there are many villages around. 
Typically, healers and shamans go to the high swamps to collect medicinal herbs, rarely venturing into the lower marsh territory, he replied, panting. Finally, we reached a country road. We had almost no strength left. Salvador, let's hurry, Abundio urged me. With our legs barely cooperating, we reached the familiar gates. Put her in the car, Abundio commanded. Salvador, drive as fast as you can. I quickly jumped into the car and raced to the nearest hospital. The woman was still alive. They rushed her into the ICU. They told me to come back the next day, so I went home. The next day, they informed me that she had come out of a coma, but no one knew if she would survive. For the first time in my life, I started to pray. I had never felt so anxious for a stranger. Days turned into nights, but nothing changed. One night, the phone rang. Salvador, she's out of the coma. I rushed to the hospital as fast as I could. The woman was asleep, and they had removed the bandages from her face as her wounds had started to heal a bit. I saw a young woman before me. Despite the bruises and swelling on her face, she appeared to be the most beautiful woman I had ever seen. In the morning, she woke up and opened her eyes. Where am I? She asked. You're in the hospital. Everything is fine now, I reassured her. She looked at me with her big eyes and asked. Who are you? My name is Salvador. What's your name? She wanted to answer quickly, but then hesitated. I don't know. Do you remember where you're from? You're home? She shook her head. From that day forward, I began calling her Luz. Unfortunately, she has complete amnesia. All you can do is wait, the doctor sympathetically told me. Salvador fell silent. Salvador, did you speak to the police about the woman who was found? Marco asked another question. Yes, I immediately contacted the police, he replied. Once, while Luz was still in a coma, an investigator came. I told him everything. We'll ask around the locals, he said, but there are about 20 villages around these marshes. While she was in a coma, the chances were too low. When Luz woke up from her coma, the investigator returned. We checked all the places and asked the locals, but in the past two months, no one has gone missing, he sighed. Zero, it could be a deliberate murder. It's hard to say. But if it is, she's not from around here, and this case will drag on for a long time. Salvador, did you try to find out where Luz is from yourself? Marco's voice was heard again. When Luz was in a coma, I couldn't take a photo, it didn't make sense. Her eyes were barely visible through the bandages. But when Luz was discharged from the hospital, we went to Abundio's. Ah, Salvador, good to see you, he smiled. Abundio, this is the woman we saved, I said. Luz, she greeted him. Very pleased, the old man said, looking at her. Abundio, we're very grateful to you, I said a little shyly. Ah, so you two are together now. That's how things go. Congratulations, he patted Salvador on the shoulder. Yes, but, unfortunately, Luz doesn't remember anything. Grandfather Abundio asked me to go into another room. After half an hour, he came out to me and said, Salvador, it's a complex case. Unfortunately, I can't help. Abundio told us which villages people usually visit the swamps from, and we went there. We visited all of them, but no one recognized Luz. Everyone remained silent. Luz, Marco suddenly broke the silence. Do you remember anything from what Salvador told you? I remember how I opened my eyes and saw him. Salvador was a stranger to me. I remember everything that happened after that moment, but I don't remember what happened before. Okay, he said calmly. Starting from tomorrow, we'll begin conducting sessions twice a week. Salvador, please resume your trips to the areas around those swamps. It's been enough time, and there's a chance that Luz will start to remember something. Walk the streets of the villages, look at the houses, and talk to the locals. I don't think it's a deliberate murder. If it were, someone would have noticed a stranger in their village. 
and if we assumed that someone among the locals planned the murder, they would have surely covered their tracks by dumping the body in the swamp. Plus, a person would have disappeared, so it has to be discovered quickly. Unfortunately, the police somehow stalled this case, Salvador said sadly. Even though my father asked them for help, they never found anything. Salvador and Lou sat in the kitchen, carefully examining the map. Luz, where should we start? Her husband asked. Salvador, I don't even know. Maybe with this one. She pointed to a village on the map. Okay, let's start with that one, and then we'll visit the rest one by one. The next morning, Salvador and Luz got into the car. It seems like we've got everything. I have the money and maps with me, water and food are in the back seat. Well, let's go. Salvador said, turning the key. August was coming to an end. The dried up grass and slightly withered trees indicated that summer would soon be behind them. Empty fields flashed by the window, occasionally interrupted by small patches of forest. Lou stared out the window, sensing some new feelings within herself and fearing to scare them away. Salvador, I feel like something is going to happen. I don't know how to explain it. I just feel it, she said. Let's hope that you'll see something familiar and start remembering, he replied. The village turned out to be very small, three streets and old houses that didn't trigger any memories for Luz. They were walking through the streets, and near one of the houses, an old woman was sitting on a bench. Hey, do you know this woman? Salvador asked, pointing to Luz. No, she replied curtly. We don't have anyone like her here. They wandered around a bit, looking around. No, Salvador, it's all unfamiliar here. Let's go further, Lou said, and they returned to the car. That day, Salvador and his wife visited five villages, but they didn't find any clues. Lou's didn't recognize these places, and the locals shook their heads when asked. Do you know this woman? Don't worry, my love, Salvador reassured his wife. We'll go again tomorrow. Look at how many places we still haven't visited. They got home late that day, as the sun had already set. The next morning, Salvador and Luz were up early again. They visited three more villages, but it was all in vain. Luz, there's a small town around 30 kilometers from here, according to the map. Let's go there. I think I didn't take enough water with me today. It was around 10 in the morning when their car stopped at a small square. Salvador, I'll wait for you here, his wife requested. Can I spend some time alone? Salvador realized that their search had been unsuccessful and Luz was becoming increasingly anxious. She had placed high hopes on these trips, but so far, they hadn't yielded any results. All right, I'll be quick, Salvador said. Don't rush, I'll wait, she replied. Salvador walked down the street and learned that the large store was about a 20-minute walk from there. He decided to buy some more groceries as they intended to visit as many villages as possible that day. On his way, he thought that Luz could possibly have a family, a husband, and children, and it saddened him. Although they couldn't officially get married because Luz had no documents, he still considered her his wife. Salvador stepped onto a bustling street with people bustling about. On the right, he saw a large store, while on the left, a golden steeple shimmered in the distance. Salvador began walking towards the store, but then abruptly turned around. Oh, what a coincidence! He exclaimed as his gaze fell upon an old tree. Since his miraculous healing, he has started looking at everything differently. How are you, my friend? He asked, patting the white trunk of the tree. Salvador didn't intend to approach the church, but a lonely-looking girl caught his attention. What are you doing here? He asked the child, surprised. My mom is sick, the girl began to explain, but then inexplicably lowered her gaze. Salvador was shocked. It was evident by the girl's unwashed hair, ragged clothes, and dirty feet that she had gone through hardship. Are you thirsty? He asked, unsure what to say. The girl nodded. Would you like to eat something? Rokelia had not eaten properly for several days and could barely stand on her feet. 
She looked straight into the eyes of the stranger. She wanted to say something, but fear held her back. Stay here, don't go anywhere. I'll be right back, Salvador said and rushed into the store. The beggar girl had such a profound impact on him that he couldn't snap out of it. He quickly filled two bags with groceries and lemonade and hurried out of the store. We are very grateful to you, sir. Rokelia said with joy. We? Salvador asked. Is it you and your mom? The girl lowered her gaze again. It's me and my friend Leo, she said, pointing to the cat. Oh, so you're not alone here. You have company. Salvador joked. He didn't want to say goodbye to the girl, but Luz was waiting for him in the car. We'll stop by on our way back and talk to the little girl. Maybe I can help her in some way, Salvador told Luz. Rokelia had never eaten so heartily this whole time. She and Leo quickly emptied an entire bag. Leo, it was so delicious. She exclaimed, hugging the cat. She was feeling so good, but it was time to get up. The old bat could return at any moment. Over the last two weeks, she has been keeping a close eye on Rokelia, checking on her three to four times a day. Rokelia decided to put everything into one bag and hide it in the hollow of the old oak tree. As she reached the bottom of the bag, something hard touched her hand. She pulled out a wallet. Opening it, she realized there was money, some plastic cards, and a photograph inside. Mom! She exclaimed. Rokelia couldn't believe her eyes. She didn't know who the man was, but he could definitely help her. Her mother's photo indicated that they were acquainted. With trembling hands, Rokelia hid the wallet beneath the elastic band of her old shorts. Leo, did you see? This is my mom. She joyfully kissed the cat. How do I find her now? Rokelia eagerly awaited the chance to go home. She decided to hide the wallet in the car's cabin. In a few days, she would start searching for this man and her mom. When Rokelia returned home, she handed the money over to her guardian and headed to her shed. She was so excited that she couldn't fall asleep. It was dark when she suddenly heard some noises. Rokelia fell silent. She heard the creaking of a latch and voices. So, have we come to an agreement? A man asked. If the price remains the same, then yes, she said, hearing a familiar gruff voice. Yes, as we agreed, confirmed the stranger. Tomorrow, the girl will finish her last day of work, and at night, you will take her. Rokelia's heart started pounding quickly. They're talking about me, she thought. I have to run. The gate closed again, and silence returned. Rokelia didn't fully understand what was happening, but she could clearly sense the danger. I won't come back here tomorrow, she told herself. Luz, I'm sorry, Salvador said, out of breath, as he returned to the car. I met a beggar girl near the church. If only you could have seen her. It's clear she needs help. On our way back, we'll talk to her. All right, Salvador, Luz replied. Let's help the child. The midday sun began to scorch as they were driving onto the highway. Let's go to this place, Luz said, pointing to the farthest village. It's a two-hour drive there. How about tomorrow morning? He asked. Salvador, I'm drawn to this place for some reason, she insisted. Throughout the journey, the girl Salvador had met couldn't escape his mind. If the mother is ill, why doesn't the girl have a guardian, he wondered. It's one thing if they lived in a remote village, but this was a city, albeit a small one. The girl looked so bad that it seemed she hadn't received care for two or three months, or maybe even longer. Her slender frame and the circles under her eyes clearly indicated hunger. And that cat. They even resembled each other. Finally, they reached a crossroads, and Salvador turned onto a dirt road. Salvador, stop, Luz told him. She got out of the car. The surroundings were unfamiliar, but something inside her responded. She walked back and forth a little. Did you remember something? Her husband asked. No, but I have this feeling like I've been here before. 
They stood there for a while and decided to enter the village. As they drove through the streets, they didn't find anyone. Surprisingly, it was a hot day, and the residents had retreated into their homes. Let's do this. You walk down this street, and I'll try to ask someone over there, Salvador suggested, pointing to the nearest alley. Luz went ahead. She looked at the houses and couldn't recognize anything, but she had a distinct sense that she had been here before. She examined the old walls and worn-out gates carefully. When she reached the end of the street, she turned back. She walked slowly, trying not to miss any details. Suddenly, she heard someone talking. Has your lover abandoned you? Luz turned abruptly. A young woman was standing by one of the houses. Are you talking to me? She asked, surprised. Laura, I understand that you're too ashamed to face people, but pretending you don't know me is going too far, the stranger protested, resting her hands on her hips. Luz approached her. Do you know me? She asked, her voice trembling. Yes, quit playing dumb. Laura Fernandez, the woman quickly replied. Turning onto the street, Salvador immediately noticed that Luz was talking to someone. Could someone have recognized her? He worried. He pulled up beside them. Hello, he greeted. Hi, the woman replied, clearly displeased. Salvador, this woman recognized me, Lou said. Do you know her? Salvador asked the unfamiliar woman. Of course, I know her. Her name is Laura Fernandez, she replied promptly. A little over a year ago, another person and I found her unconscious near the lowland marshes. She was in a coma for a long time, and when she woke up, she couldn't remember anything, Salvador quickly explained. How can that be? The woman exclaimed. Indeed, more than a year ago, Laura disappeared. She was searched for several days, but wasn't found. I'm her neighbor, Eleonora. Eleonora, we've been trying to restore my wife's memory for a long time, but so far, we haven't succeeded. Please help us, Salvador implored. Well, what can I do? She asked, looking puzzled. Tell us about her, Salvador requested. Her house is right here, the neighbor pointed with her hand. That's where she lived. You can go and have a look at it. No one lives there now. The gate creaked, and Salvador, Luz, and Eleonora entered the yard. It feels like everything is familiar, but I can't remember, Luz said wearily. Why do you call her Luz? The neighbor asked. Luz couldn't even remember her own name, so we started calling her Luz, Salvador explained. Tell me about her. Well, what is there to tell? Eleonora shrugged. As far back as I can remember, Laura lived with her grandfather, Mateo. His daughter, Nora, went to the city when she was young and stayed there. Nobody knows who Laura's father was. But one day, Nora brought a girl here and asked her father to look after her for the summer. That's how Laura stayed here. And a few years later, they told her grandfather that his daughter had died in a car accident. We were the same age, Laura and I. We used to go to school together in the neighboring village. Grandfather Mateo was a skilled herbalist. He could find herbs that others were afraid to search for. As far as I know, he was the last person who could safely traverse the lowland marshes. Oh, it was a dangerous business. There was a time when people offered large sums for rare herbs. So many people got lost in those swamps. At first, Laura's grandfather left her with neighbors, but as she grew older, he started taking her with him. It's not like she learned the trade from her grandfather, but she did have some knowledge about herbs. When Laura came of age, Pedro from the outskirts started following her around. He told Grandfather Mateo he intended to marry her. He didn't object. He wanted to settle his granddaughter down for life. But it turned out Pedro had been spending time with Laura and then abandoned her. He left the village and no one saw him again. Laura gave birth to a girl, Roquelia. Grandfather Mateo understood everything and didn't abandon Laura. So, they started living together as a family. Eleonora paused for a moment. Please continue, Salvador told her. 
When Grandfather Mateo got very old, Laura began gathering herbs. Rokelia was around three or four years old at the time. Her grandfather gave her directions on where to find specific herbs, but he understood that going after rare herbs was dangerous. So Laura collected common herbs on the outskirts of the marshes. It didn't bring in much money, but it was enough for food. And when Grandfather Mateo passed away, life became tough for her. She wanted to go to the city to find work, but who would take care of her child? Besides, she loved her daughter immensely. So she stayed here. During the herb gathering season, she used to leave Rokelia with me. One day, she came to me and said, Eleonora, please look after Rokelia. You're going to gather herbs? I asked. No, I have some business to attend to. Please, she replied. All right, leave her with me, I said. From that day on, we didn't see her anymore. Where is Rokelia now? Salvador asked. People VE been searching for Laura for several days, and Rokelia was with me. The police searched all the areas near the marshes, but they didn't venture deep inside. Everyone knew that if Laura went there, there was no way back. But there was still hope because Laura had an unparalleled sense of direction in those places, thanks to her grandfather, Mateo. For days after Laura had disappeared, a police officer told me that if they didn't find her, they would look for one of Laura's relatives, otherwise, Rokelia would end up in an orphanage. Laura was still missing, and I was informed that some distant relative had to come for Rokelia. A week later, an elderly woman arrived. I think her name was Clodomira. She took Rokelia, but the police continued to search for Laura. One day, the local constable came to me and said, we're looking for Laura, and she's living comfortably with some man. I didn't understand him at first. We closed the case, he said. She left a note for her relative, who took Rokelia. It explained everything. I found my love. Please don't look for me. And a month later, some people came to look at the house. What do you want there? I asked them. We're inspecting the house. We want to buy it. Buy it? I was surprised. We have an agreement with the girl's guardian. She wants to sell this house to buy an apartment in the city. So, they bought the house. They threw everything out and left only the bare walls and the hearth. Please, keep an eye on it, they asked me, and I left. Since then, no one has appeared here. Luz was heard creaking on the floorboards as she emerged from the house. I thought I might find some things, but the house is empty. There's nothing in there, she sighed with regret. Yes, the new owners were here for about three days, lighting a campfire and making some changes. They even wanted to bring in new furniture, but it seems that didn't work out, Eleonora replied. They stood by the house for a little while longer. It was around six o'clock, and Luz and Salvador needed to head back home. Eleonora, thank you so much. You've been a great help to us, Salvador thanked her. If we ever need your assistance again, would you help? Of course, she replied, looking sympathetically at Luz. They drove back quickly as the sun was steadily setting below the horizon. Luz, I'll call my acquaintance in the police department to start the search for the girl, Salvador said, taking out his phone. Let's see, where are my business cards? He began searching his pockets for his wallet, but it was nowhere to be found. Did I lose it? Not now. Salvador exclaimed in frustration. Salvador, when was the last time you saw your wallet? Luz tried to help her husband. I used it at the store. I remember. I bought some food for the young beggar girl and was so anxious that I left my wallet in one of the bags. Let's go back there. She was standing near the church. An hour later, they stopped near an old oak tree, but it was almost dark. The church gates were locked and there was no one around. How could I have been so careless? Salvador scolded himself. Salvador, let's go home, his wife calmly suggested. We'll come back here tomorrow morning. The day had been very hard, and Salvador agreed. He understood that there was nothing they could do at this moment. Rokelia couldn't sleep all night. 
She couldn't wait for morning to come. Finally, dawn broke. She retrieved the wallet from the straw, unfolded it, and looked at the photograph. Mommy, we will definitely meet soon, she whispered through tears. She took out the photograph from her pocket and held it close to her chest. Suddenly, the door swung open. Rokelia quickly jumped, hiding the wallet behind her back. What do you have there? The old woman asked. Nothing, Rokelia replied with a trembling voice. Give it to me. The guardian shouted angrily. I don't have anything, Rokelia cried. Clodomira grabbed her shoulder forcefully. The girl screamed in pain and dropped the wallet. The guardian immediately picked it up. What is this? A wallet? Did you steal it? She accused Rokelia. No, a man lost it, and I found it, the girl cried. You little brat. You've been trying to cause me trouble these past few days, she shouted as she forcefully pushed Rokelia to the ground. Today, you're staying home. Thank goodness they'll take you away tonight. No, please, let me go, Clodomira pleaded with Rokelia. I'll bring you a lot of money today. Please. Rokelia heard the creaking of the door inside the house. No. She cried. She had been crying for half an hour. She was thirsty, so she approached her old bucket and noticed her mother's photograph on the ground. Mom, my beloved, you didn't abandon me, the girl said, kissing her mother's image. It was already nine, and Rokelia didn't know what to do next. Suddenly, she heard a noise. Leo, my kitty. She whispered joyfully. The cat was trying to squeeze into the barn, but the gaps were too narrow. He attempted to pry the boards with his paws, but he couldn't succeed. What are we going to do now? Rokelia sobbed, resting her head on her knees. Leo, you got it right. Help me, my friend. She reached out her fingers and reached the cat's fur. The cat happily licked her fingers. Rokelia's temples throbbed strongly. She quickly dug a small hole in the ground, took out a small yellow piece of paper, and wrote, Rokelia. She couldn't read or write, but that was one thing her mother had taught her. She let the note dry, carefully rolled it up, and then, after some thought, added her mother's photograph inside. Rokelia struggled to tie the note to the cat's neck. The gaps were too small, and she couldn't get a secure knot. Suddenly, the door squeaked open, and Clodomira appeared on the doorstep. At last, Rokelia managed to tie a knot. What are you doing there? Clodomira heard a rustle and went to the barn. Leo, run. Rokelia shouted. The guardian noticed the cat and tried to catch him, but Leo evaded her. She quickly grabbed a rock from the ground and threw it at him. The cat fell. Leo, no. Rokelia cried. Please, get up. Leo, get up. Clodomira saw a pitchfork nearby and grabbed it. The cat, limping, headed towards a large hole in the fence. Leo, hurry. Rokelia shouted with all her might. Clodomira noticed some forks and quickly picked them up. The cat managed to slip through just in time. She rushed to the gate, pulled back the latch, and examined the area along the fence, but the cat was nowhere in sight. You little wretch! The guardian yelled and headed towards the barn. You're in for it today. You'll be sleeping in the cellar. In anger, she stormed into the barn and grabbed Rokelia by the arm. No! Where are you taking me? The girl resisted, choking back tears. The old bat dragged Rokelia through the entire house and stopped in the last room. Lifting the latch, she opened the cellar door. That's where you belong, she growled maliciously. No. Rokelia resisted. Lowering the girl down the stairs, she pulled her up so Rokelia couldn't climb back up. It was cold and damp in the basement. Rokelia was very scared, but in the darkness, she suddenly heard. Rokelia, my girl. Mom, she exclaimed. The girl felt her mother was nearby, and she would definitely find her. Do you know the girl who was here yesterday? Salvador asked as he entered the churchyard. 
the little beggar girl? She stands here every day. She never takes a day off, the janitor joked. Where does she live? Who knows? She's usually on duty by eight. Salvador checked his watch. It was half past eight. Salvador, let's call the police while we're waiting. Maybe they'll find Roquelia today? Dad, hello, Salvador said into the phone. Hello, son, how are you? Dad, I really need your help. Salvador talked on the phone for a while, jotting down various numbers in his notebook. Okay, Dad. Thanks. Yes, I'll call Constancio. It was already around 10, but the girl still hadn't shown up. Constancio? Hello. Fernando said anxiously. About Roquelia Fernandez? Yes, of course, I know her. She's fine. And she has a good guardian. They're at the seaside. They'll be back in a couple of days. Clodomira took the girl to relax before school. Yes, it's all arranged. Two days from now. Fernando was trembling all over. She's gone too far, that old hag. He cursed. Now we'll both have to answer for this. Luz, everything is fine. We found your daughter, Salvador said joyfully. You just need to wait for two more days. Her guardian took her to the beach before school. Oh God, it's such a relief. Luz beamed. Even though she couldn't remember her daughter, she felt love overflowing within her. Clodomira counted the money with joy. What luck. She rejoiced. The girl gave me such a parting gift. She quickly took out her credit cards from her wallet. I need to destroy the evidence, she thought. Dealing with the cards is dangerous. Suddenly, a car pulled up to the house, and there was a knock. Fernando rushed into the yard, angry. Well, have you had enough fun? They're looking for your girl, and her mother has been found. Clodomira opened her mouth in shock. It can't be. It can. And she has some serious connections. It's the end for both of us. Hurry and take the girl home and get her ready. They'll pick her up in two days. You're out of this house. Fernando, can't you handle this somehow? She said plaintively. Are you out of your mind? The prosecutor called me. He hissed with anger. Fernando drove away. Clodomira was standing in the middle of the yard. Her small eyes darted nervously. I have two more days, she finally said. Today they'll take the girl, and I'll say she was kidnapped. I'll come up with a story that gypsies blackmailed me and forced Roquelia to beg, promising that they'd kill both of us. They came at night and took her away. They threatened that if I went to the police, they'd lock me in the house and set it on fire. Chaotic thoughts swirled in her head. The main thing is to align everything. They won't do anything to me, she muttered to herself. Luz, it's already 12 o'clock. Let's go for a walk somewhere, and then we'll stop at a cafe for lunch. The girl still hasn't shown up. Maybe she won't come today. If anything, they'll let me know. I asked one of the church workers to call me for a reward, Salvador said tiredly. Honestly, I'm hungry too, she agreed. They got in the car and drove towards the park. Cat Leo lay in the tall grass. He was hiding to recover a bit. The stone had injured his hind leg and thigh. It was painful for him to walk. He slowly made his way towards the church, taking long pauses. It was around five in the evening when he finally saw the church gates. It took him another hour to reach them. So, did no one call yet? Salvador asked disappointedly. Maybe the girl wasn't here today. Let's go home. How about we swing by and check one more time? His wife suggested. All right, let's do that. About 20 minutes later, they arrived at the old oak tree. Getting out of the car, they approached the church. The girl wasn't there. She probably still didn't show up, Salvador sighed. Suddenly, they heard a faint meowing. It's her cat. I know it, Salvador approached him. 
Well, are you here without your owner today? Has she let you down? He reached out his hand and petted the cat. Suddenly, he noticed a rope around its neck. Salvador tried to lift the cat, but it meowed in pain. You're hurt, buddy, he said with concern. Luz, help me out here. The woman rushed over, and together they removed the rope from the cat. What's this? Salvador wondered as he held the bundle in his hand. Roquelia, he read the note and saw a photo of his wife. Salvador couldn't utter a word. Luz, this girl is your daughter. He said, showing the note and photo to his wife. My God, how is this possible? Salvador, please, let's find her, Lou sobbed. I feel that the girl is in trouble. Salvador calmed down a bit and dialed a number with trembling hands. Constancio, hello. Fernando's phone was ringing, but he didn't hear it. After the conversation with his aunt, he understood that he was in deep trouble now. He returned to work and closed the door. The cabinet door creaked and a bottle of brandy appeared on the table. Damn it all. He cursed and emptied the glass. So, he sat alone until the bottle was empty. It was already dark. Salvador, I'm begging you, do something. His wife cried. Luz, calm down. We'll find her soon, he reassured her, embracing her shoulders. He was waiting for Constancio's call, but it hadn't come yet. Clodomira sat in the kitchen, keeping the lights off. They had agreed that the gypsies would come when it got dark. The house was in a remote location, so she had nothing to worry about. Suddenly, someone quietly tapped on the window. She became alert. Probably just mice, she thought. The tapping continued. She sat down at the table, and the tapping persisted. What the hell is that noise? Clodomira cursed. The tapping on the window grew louder. It could be heard at one window and then another. Clodomira was getting seriously scared. The tapping continued. The room was dark. She wanted to turn on the lights, but fear kept her from getting up. Suddenly, there was a rustling, and a small window opened. Devils, go away! She yelled. Something resembling a snake slithered over her feet. She jumped up and screamed. Suddenly, in the far corner, someone's eyes lit up. No! She cried. Devils, leave me alone! Clodomira was driven to madness by fear. Something touched her leg again, and suddenly she felt a bite. Ah! She screamed as if something had cut her. She wanted to open the door, but couldn't find it. Everything was a jumble in her head. Suddenly, something bit her again. Devils want to eat me. She screamed at the top of her lungs. At that moment, the gypsies knocked on the gate. Do you hear those screams? One of them asked, holding a sack. That old witch must have set a trap for us, the other replied, and they quickly scurried to the car parked in the bushes. Clodomira continued to pace around the room, screaming incessantly. Finally, she found the door handle and ran outside. The cat also limped out onto the street through the open door. Help! She shouted as she was rushing around the yard. A police car arrived at the house. What's going on here? Salvador asked upon hearing the screams. He, his wife, and several policemen quickly got out of the car. The gate was locked. Let's get this guy in there. A young policeman shouted, Lift me up. Salvador and two other young men helped the officer climb over. Within five minutes, he opened the gate. The car's headlights illuminated the house. A crazed woman was running back and forth in the yard, clutching her head. Sergio, Rodrigo, deal with her, and we'll go look for the girl, one of the police officers ordered. Turning on a flashlight, he said, Salvador, Luz, let's start with the shed. The shed door was locked. An old lock quickly yielded, and they opened it. The police officers illuminated the space. The smell indicated that there was a toilet in the shed, suggesting that someone had been living there. Roquelia! Salvador shouted. 
No one responded. They searched everything but found no one. Entering the house, they searched all the rooms, but the girl was nowhere to be found. Suddenly, they heard the familiar meowing of the cat. Leo, are you here? Salvador petted the cat. It's her cat. The cat meowed and limped forward. Then he returned again. He wants to tell us something, Lou's guest. Let's follow the cat, a policeman said. Leo tried to scratch the thick carpet in the far room. Move that rug. Salvador yelled. They noticed a small door in the floor. Voices could be heard from below. Mom. Rokelia cried out. I'm here. The door is locked. We need to break it. Shouted the policeman. I'll fetch a crowbar from the car. Rokelia, it's all right. We'll help you. Salvador shouted at the top of his lungs. The girl heard something breaking through the floor. After a few minutes, the hole was fully open. Mom, Mommy. Rokelia cried out from somewhere in the corner. Luz approached the basement, but she lost her balance and fell down. Laura opened her eyes. She regained consciousness and heard her daughter's familiar voice. Mommy, my love. Rokelia gently stroked her mother's hand. How are you, Luz? Salvador said. I'm Laura, she whispered softly. Salvador wanted to hug her so badly, but she had a concussion and couldn't get up. All right. Then let's start over, he smiled. My name is Salvador. What's your name? Laura, her eyes sparkled with joy. Laura quickly recovered, and in a few days, they would release her to go home. Salvador was sitting by her bedside. There's one thing I can't understand. What were you doing there? He asked her. Do you mean in the swamps? She understood. It's quite simple. After my grandfather passed away, it became difficult for Rokelia and me to survive. We didn't have enough money. One day, a stranger knocked on our door and said, I'll pay you good money. Find me this herb. This herb is very rare, and it can only be found in the lowlands, I replied. Well, think it over. I really need it, and I'll pay you any amount for it. The man left, and I kept thinking, should I take the risk? I knew the lowland swamps. My grandfather had taught me a lot, how to distinguish the moss from the surface swamp grass and how to navigate the quagmire. If I could get that herb, Rokelia and I could live normally for a year. I decided that I would go for it. I took Rokelia to Eleonora's, but didn't tell her anything. If she had known, she would never have let me go. I went through the most dangerous part of the swamp. There was just a little left to reach the herb, but then it started raining. I was carefully treading along a narrow path, but I slipped on the slippery clay, grabbed onto a birch branch, but it was old. I rolled down, and then I felt a strong blow to my head, and then darkness. Rokelia couldn't quite get used to her new home. She's been wandering around, examining the beautiful furniture and the large paintings on the walls. Rokelia, my dear, she heard her mother's voice, are you up already? Waking up early was the only thing that remained from Rokelia's past life. Mom, Mommy, I love you so much. She ran up to Laura. I promise we'll never be apart again, her mother said, kissing the girl. You two are early birds. Salvador approached them. Uncle Salvador, come to us, Rokelia hugged him. They were standing silently, embracing each other. Suddenly, Rokelia ran downstairs and opened the door. She stepped out into a beautiful garden. Leo, my beloved kitty. The girl spread her arms wide. Along the path among the bushes, her cat came running towards her, purring with joy. If you're enjoying it as well, leave a like and subscribe to the channel.